Well, if you've made it this far in your studies in chemistry and in science in general, you have no doubt encountered one of these. Balanced chemical equations do provide us a lot of information about a chemical reaction, but if we step back for a second, what does it actually take for a chemical reaction to occur? Well, in a word, for most chemical reactions, it takes a collision. That's right, the particles have to come together. Now, I think it's obvious that not all collisions are going to result in a chemical reaction. I mean, we're constantly being bombarded by nitrogen molecules and oxygen molecules in the air all around us. In fact, under the right conditions, those two molecules are going to combine together to create a poisonous gas, nitrogen dioxide. And clearly, and thankfully, that doesn't happen. So it can't just be a collision that is going to be necessary for a chemical reaction to occur. Now, there is something called collision theory. And there's three main points to collision theory. First, and I think it's fairly obvious, the particles have to collide. That is, in order to react, the particles have to come together. Secondly, they have to collide at the appropriate orientation, meaning those molecules have to be in the correct geometry, that is, certain atoms have to collide with certain atoms in order for bonds to break and new bonds to form. And finally, there has to be the appropriate amount of energy. Just because they collide, and just because they might collide at the appropriate orientation, if there's not enough energy to overcome the attractive forces of the bonds they're breaking, then there's not going to be a reaction either. Just how much energy do these particles need when they collide? Well, we have to bring in another theory here, and that's called the transition state theory, and it's best visualized through something called a potential energy diagram. Now, your potential energy diagram is going to look fairly similar to an enthalpy diagram because it does deal with the overall enthalpy change between reactants and products. In fact, it differs depending on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic in the forward direction. And that certainly comes into play when we're analyzing potential energy diagrams. But the thing that we're really looking at, especially when we talk about how much energy is required for a reaction to occur, is something called the activation energy. Now, if we take a look at this diagram here, we're going to see that this represents an exothermic reaction. And we can tell that from our knowledge of thermochemistry because our reactants have higher energy than our products, meaning there's a net energy output as this reaction proceeds. Now, you're going to notice that there is an activation energy indicated here both in the forward and reverse direction. And we can see here that the activation energy barrier in the forward direction is less than the activation energy barrier in the reverse. And that maybe gives us a little bit of a clue, some insight, into why we generally tend to see most reactions, most common, especially exothermic reactions, as proceeding in only one direction. It's because of the magnitudes of these activation energy barriers. The activation energy barrier actually plays into how reactive a reaction is. The lower the activation energy, the more reactive or more likely it is for that reaction to occur. The higher the activation energy barrier, well, the less likely it is for that reaction to occur, or the more energy it's going to take for that reaction to occur. Now, this is called transition state theory. You see, right at the top, where that activation energy barrier hits its maximum, that's what we refer to as the transition state. Theoretically, it's transitioning from reactants to products or products to reactants. And up there, we have something that we call the activated complex. And for students first learning these potential energy diagrams, the activated complex can be the most challenging part. So let's take a closer look at this diagram to see if we can better understand these activated complexes and how we're supposed to construct them and how we're supposed to interpret them. And in order for them to be reasonable, we're just looking for them to meet a couple of criteria. And the first one is that they have to have the same number of atoms as the reactants and products. So as you can see here, if we take a look at the reactant side, we have two atoms of hydrogen and we have two atoms of fluorine. If we take a look at the product side, we can see that we also have two atoms of hydrogen and two atoms of fluorine. So if we look at the reasonable activated complex for this particular reaction, we should have two hydrogen and two fluorine. And we can see here that this activated complex does have two hydrogen and two fluorine. Now, if we take a closer look at the reactants, we can see that we have a hydrogen bound to a hydrogen, and we have a fluorine bound to a fluorine. And if we take a look at the products, we can see that we have two molecules, each consisting of one hydrogen-fluorine bond. So as we go up to this activated complex, the activated complex is a theoretical high-energy complex that is transitioning from reactants to products. So in order for our reactants to transition into our products, the fluorine-fluorine bond has to break. The hydrogen-hydrogen bond has to break, and two hydrogen-fluorine bonds have to form. And so as we look at our proposed activated complex, we can see that these dashed or dotted lines represent a couple of different things. 
The dashed or dotted lines between the adjacent fluorines and the adjacent hydrogens here represent bonds breaking. And the dashed or dotted lines between the adjacent hydrogen and fluorine represents bonds forming. So in order for these activated complex to be considered reasonable, they do have to meet a couple of criteria. One is the number of atoms that we have in our activated complex has to match the number of atoms that we have in our reactants and the number of atoms that we have in our products. That is, it has to balance out. And it also has to account for the appropriate bonds breaking and the appropriate bonds forming. Now it is important to note that because these are theoretical, there are different ways for these activated complexes to meet these two criteria. And therefore, it is possible to have more than one reasonable activated complex. Well, now that we understand the basics of collision theory, how do we use this to our advantage? Well, if we understand that a chemical reaction first must have particles colliding, and must have the appropriate amount of energy, that is, sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier when they collide, then we can use this to say, well, if we increase the number of collisions, and increase the energy of those collisions, then we can increase the likelihood that these collisions are going to be successful. How do we do that? Well, one way would be to speed up those particles. Now, how do we speed up particles? Well, we, we heat them up. And what that does is it not only gives the particles more energy so that when they collide, they're going to have a greater amount of energy in that collision, but also since they're moving around faster, they're likely to collide more. So increasing the temperature of a reaction increases the number of collisions because the particles are moving faster, but it also increases the energy of those collisions, therefore increasing the likelihood of a successful collision. We can also increase the surface area of a solid within a gaseous or an aqueous or liquid system. And what that does is it increases exposure of that solid to the gas or to the liquid, further increasing the number of collisions. And as we said, if we increase the number of collisions, we can increase the likelihood of a successful collision and increase the probability of a reaction. Yet a third way would be to increase the concentration of a substance, especially if we're dealing with an aqueous solution or if we're dealing with a gas, we can increase the number of moles of that substance within the aqueous environment or within the container that it's in, in the case of a gas, which increases the probability that there's going to be a collision and increases the likelihood of a successful collision. You see, all of these factors, temperature, concentration, surface area, are going to allow us to control or manipulate the chemical reaction itself, increasing the likelihood or decreasing the likelihood of a collision, depending on what we are trying to do for that particular chemical reaction. So one last thing before we go, it should be noted that activation energy is something that cannot be easily changed for a given chemical reaction, not by increasing or decreasing the temperature or the surface area or concentration. But what we can do is introduce a catalyst. Now a catalyst provides an alternate pathway or an alternate set of pathways for a chemical reaction to occur, and typically these pathways are gonna be lower energy. That is, it's gonna increase the number of effective collisions under a given set of conditions for a chemical reaction and allow more of these reactions to result in successful collisions and increase the likelihood of a reaction. So if we try and visualize the effect of a catalyst using a potential energy diagram like this one here, what we're going to notice is that all of the collisions that occur here, that is, all of those that collisions that do not have sufficient energy are not going to occur. They have not met the activation energy barrier. But the addition of a catalyst allows an alternate pathway to occur where we are still going to have the same reactants and the same products. It's just that this alternate pathway allows for lower energy collisions to result in a chemical reaction that leaves us with the desired products. So even though the addition of a catalyst does not speed up the particles nor increase the number of collisions, what it does do is provide an alternate lower energy pathway that allows more of the collisions to result in a successful chemical reaction. Now as to how the catalyst actually impacts the transition of reactants to products, we will take a closer look at that when we delve into reaction mechanisms. So after watching this video, hopefully you've got a better understanding of how and why chemical reactions occur, at least according to transition state theory and collision theory, and how we can use things like surface area, concentration, temperature, and even catalysts to control a chemical reaction and increase the likelihood or decrease the likelihood of a chemical reaction occurring. Thanks for watching.